There's a line of thinking that divides the Buddhist teachings into two very separate categories. One is his teachings for lay people, aimed at finding happiness in this lifetime and in future lifetimes. And then there are the teachings for the monastics, aiming at getting out of the cycle of birth and redeath and rebirth and redeath, getting out of that cycle entirely. And the two sets of teachings, they say, are very separate. In the first, you're amassing merit, and then in the second, you're letting it go. But from the point of view of the forest tradition, there's not that clear a distinction. In fact, there are many of the lessons that you learn from teachings for finding happiness in daily life that are going to apply to the practice all the way up to the highest levels. And this is one of the reasons why the training is such as it is. There's so much, so much emphasis placed on keeping the monastery clean, looking after the monastery, repairing it, doing the work that needs to be done. As John Mahabu would like to point out, if you do this intently, you develop the quality of intentness. You develop the qualities of being careful, being meticulous, being observant, all of which are going to be really useful in the practice. The case in point is the Buddha's teachings on how to find happiness in the present life, aimed primarily at using your wealth properly. First, it's gaining wealth, looking after it, using it properly. The four principles altogether. The first is initiative. You don't just sit there waiting for things to come. You don't say that, I'm going to go past my greed by not doing any work at all. That, as John Lee would say, is letting go like a pauper. You let go and you're still a pauper. When you realize that you need wealth, you do whatever is needed. As the Buddha said, earned with the strength of your arms, the sweat of your brow. Righteous wealth, righteously gained. You look for areas where wealth can be made in that way, and then you apply yourself. You stir up the effort. When you've gained wealth, then the second step is to protect it. You look after it, you repair it, the things that need to be repaired. You protect the things that need to be protected. You look after your things. If things get lost, you look for them. You don't treat them casually. The third step is to use your wealth in an even way. Even here means that you're not too frugal and you're not too spendthrift. It's interesting that the Buddha criticizes being overly frugal. You would think that he would be a very frugal person, and he was frugal in a lot of ways, but was, he realized that it, was, it gets to the point of being stingy. And then it's bad for you. You develop a bad attitude towards the enjoyment of pleasure. If you see the enjoyment of pleasure as a bad thing, it's going to be hard to practice. Because after all, nirvana is the ultimate pleasure. Right concentration is a very strong moral pleasure. It's going to require a lot of work to get it. But if you see people enjoying pleasure as a bad thing, first if you're not willing to enjoy it and then you see other people enjoying it, you decide it's a bad thing. It's hard to develop empathetic joy. It's hard to have the right attitude toward happiness. So you use your wealth just right. You don't get into debt. You don't spend it too much. You save some for the future. And then the fourth quality is to have admirable friends. 
people who will teach you about the fact that there's more than just wealth or material wealth in this life. You want to prepare for, for the future beyond the end of this life. They teach you about conviction, they teach you about discernment, generosity, virtue. They themselves are good examples. When you hang around people like this, then you use your wealth wisely. You invest it not only in your pleasure in this lifetime, but also your well-being in future lifetimes. Now those are the principles that are set out for finding happiness in the present life. And they apply very much to our meditation initiative. If you don't put the effort in, it's not going to happen. And when problems come up, you don't just give up. You said other people have faced problems like this in the past, and they were able to get past them. It's not beyond human capabilities to get the mind to settle down and to keep it settled down. Of course, we're taking your wealth here as, as your concentration. The Buddha also says that there's the wealth of goodwill. Because goodwill is something you can create in abundance. There's no limit on the amount of goodwill you can create. And it's good and soothing for the mind. And it's also one of those things that helps the mind get into concentration. If you have ill will for the people around you, it's going to carry into your meditation. So develop goodwill as well. Develop concentration. Regard the problems that come up in concentration as challenges and not as obstacles. You run into pain, and John Lee's image is like digging down into the ground. You know there's gold someplace in the ground, but you happen to run into a rock. The lazy people, when they hit the rock, will just give up. It's the people with initiative who figure out there must be a way around the rock. You dig here and you dig there. You finally get past the rock, and there's the gold. So you're willing to dig around in the problem of pain. Don't let it discourage you. And the same with distraction. There are ways of dealing with distraction. You try to recognize when the distraction comes, how it comes. And realize when it's there, it doesn't stay there 24-7. It comes and, and then it goes. But then you dig it up again. Why did you do that? What was the reason? This is where you get to see the allure. Why the mind goes for that. And then you can compare that with the drawbacks. Until you decide that it's not worth it. That's when you develop some dispassion for that. Get past it. So there are ways of dealing with the problems that come up, and you want to take the initiative to keep working at it and not get discouraged. The fact that it sometimes takes a long time is not a sign that you're not going to be able to do it. It's simply a sign that it's a problem that you haven't figured out yet. But all the problems that come up in meditation are soluble. The one problem that's really get, puts you at a dead end is if you get lazy and you don't do it. As John Fung used to say, when you do the meditation, whatever comes up, there's going to be a solution. But if you don't do the meditation, there's no solution for any of the problems. So maintain your initiative. Keep giving yourself pep talks, because this can be done. Once you start getting results, then you try to maintain them. Don't throw them away. And don't see them as something that you maintain only while you're sitting here with your eyes closed or while you're doing walking meditation. You go around as you go around the monastery throughout the day. Try to maintain your center. 
protect this. Now, there are other things that you may be tempted to protect. And you say, no, this is what I've got to maintain my protection for. This is what's important. And John Lee says it's like having a, a dish of food. You want to cover over the dish so the flies don't get it. If you carry it around just exposed, all kinds of bugs are going to land on it, and they're going to bring disease into the food. So you protect it. Find one spot in the body that's very sensitive to the breath, that tells you this is when the breath is getting too long, this is when it's getting too short. If any fear comes up in the mind, there's a tightening in that spot, any greed, any any negative emotion that gives rise to a tightening in that spot. You try to maintain that as an open area. Think of the breath coming in, going out. Protect that openness. Don't clamp up around it. We, some, we often think that by clamping up in the energy around the body, we protect it. We don't. We don't. Your mindfulness is the protection. Your alertness is the protection. The continuity of your mindfulness and alertness, those are the protections. The openness is actually strength. As for using your wealth, you do want to focus on the breath in such a way that gives rise to a sense of pleasure. Actively cultivate that. Don't be afraid of getting stuck on the pleasure of concentration. I guess you have to get stuck here first so that you can pull away your attachments to a lot of unskillful thoughts. Thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of ill will, fearful thoughts, jealous thoughts. You want to give the mind good food so they can stop feeding on its old garbage. But you have to be careful with that, with that sense of well-being. Don't leave the breath and just wallow in the pleasure. You have to remember that the sense of pleasure that comes from the breath comes from the fact that you are alert to the breath, that you are paying careful attention to the breath. And John Lee's images of someone who's working and getting a wage at the same time. If you work for a while, get your wages and then quit the job and just enjoy your wages until they run, they run out, and then you come back and try to get the job back again. Fortunately, in this case, the, the boss is, is kind and will take you back. But there's no continuity, and, there, and when there's no continuity, there's no chance for the, the meditation to grow, to develop. So keep working with the breath, enjoying the, the side effects, but don't leave that working with the breath. Remember your initiative. When John Lee talks about the work of concentration, which is basically directed thought and evaluation, constantly checking on the breath making sure it's just right, learning how to maintain it, learning what to do with it, how to nurture yourself. And there will be times when you don't need to do the direct thought and evaluation. You can just put them aside. But still there's the work of mindfulness, just being alert to breath. You're feeling surrounded by the breath. Feeling at one with the breath. The pleasure will be there at the same place, but don't shift your focus away from the breath to the pleasure. That's how you use your wealth properly. And as for hanging out with good friends, well, this applies both outside and inside. Your inside good friends are all the voices that are encouraging you to practice. The bad friends you've got to avoid are the ones that would pull you away for one reason or another. You
your old concerns. The ones that would eat into your meditation. You've got to realize this is your main source of wealth here, your main source of well-being. You don't know what's going to happen in the future, but you do know that you will need inner strength in order to deal with whatever comes up. So this is the wealth you've got to protect. This is the wealth you've got to maintain. So any voices in the mind that help you with that, those are your good friends. Any voices that would pull you off into other issues, those are not. So remember that the qualities that lead to happiness on the material level, in line with the Dharma, are going to have a carryover effect as you meditate. This means as you go through the day and you're doing your chores around the monastery, or if you're living at home doing your chores around the house, you want to bring a quality of initiative and intentness to what you're doing. Give it your full attention. Do it carefully. This applies to looking after the physical aspects of the monastery, whatever your chores may be, whatever your duties may be. You want to develop that habit of being careful about what you're doing. having a sense of just right in all of your tasks, and then applying that to your meditation. Because after all, it's the same mind. The mind that's going around looking after the monastery is the same mind that's looking after the mind. So if you develop good habits in one area, they're going to spread to the other. This may be one of the things that Lumpur Dun meant when he said that practice of Dharma is all one thing clear through. 